Mary Louise Bertram and crew here have uh, graciously uh, offered to start our day. And uh, she has also requested no introduction. However, she is near and dear to the Angelman community, as many of you are aware. So thank you, Mary Louise, for coming. And uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, four years ago, I stood up on the stage with Erin Sheldon at the first uh, Fast Education Summit. And since then, the Angelman communication and literacy revolution has really exploded. Um, there are many amazing and committed, talented professionals involved in the Angelman communication and literacy revolution, but this is a revolution that has been led by families. And it is my huge honour to introduce some of those amazing parents here to you today. So, um, sorry, this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, we have Shauna Moreno, Karen Hurst, <laughs> Teresa Eberhardt, Corey Stell, and Kelly Meister. Okay, so let's get this show on the road. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Sean Moreno. Um, today we just want you guys to find one idea you can take home and easily implement into your daily life. And today I'm talking about aided language stimulation um, for the long haul. Our story is Chance is now 12. And when Chance was about four years ago, we started with when he was about four years old, we started with uh, picture books and pecs and all sorts of different devices and things that therapists would bring us and nothing really stuck um, because basically no one knew how to teach us how to teach him how to use it. And it wasn't until four years ago when Mary Louise came and uh, explained to us what aided language stimulation was and how we can use that to teach our kids to communicate. Um, and basically what she said was, use your system to talk to your kid and they will see it in action and they will learn. Um, just like babies do when you know, we talk to them as they're little tiny things and they start to figure out, oh, all these sounds actually mean something. And um, they start to figure out how to talk. So what we did is we started with Pod um, and we started modeling things, talking to Chance about things like, you know, going to school and what we're about to eat and things like that. And he really wasn't interested. And this was about four years ago. Um, eventually we figured out he didn't care about that and we needed to find something he really liked to talk about. So what we did is we started using our device and our books to talk to him about, um, playing with cars, playing with toys. Uh, we used this device to say, make the dinosaur roar, crash the cars, you know. He got a kick out of that. Uh, once we started doing that for a good three to six months, every time we would sit down and play, he actually started to touch the book and tell us he wanted us to make the dinosaur roar and let's put the cars in the toy oven and bake them and silly things like that. And he just had a great time with that. Um, and that's really been the thing he's uh, really wanted to talk about. Um, so what we've done, and that was a good two and a half years ago. So we've really taken the long road. It's been a very slow journey, but we try and be patient. More days than not, chances not interested. Um, we're using the device as often as we can fit it into our day, but it's not consistent. But he is interested still, and it's, it's now 12. He uses it to tell us, you know, get him snacks, and where's my dinosaurs, and um, boss his sisters around, tell him to get out of his room, and silly things like that. So I guess all I want to end with is that when you're, using a, when you're starting out with a system, we really want to remember it's a long-term thing. Um, be patient, you're learning a new language, 
and it'll start to stick. Um, and also here is a bunch of resources where you can get more information on how to do the aided language and the process and more ask questions and discussions. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Karen Hurst. Uh, my son Nico is five years old. And we also, uh, my husband and I also have uh, almost three year old twins. So uh, my section is sort of really based, uh, going off, going on to what Shauna talked about and really talking about how this is real life. And part of the work of real life is figuring out how do we set ourselves up for the best chance at getting things done? And what do we do when that doesn't work out or when we're not doing what we hoped we would be able to do? Uh, so we really, in our family, think about communication as something that we all do together. So this top picture here is a picture of the twins using our family communication system. Uh, we use Speak for Yourself and uh, they're trying to figure out where they're right now really interested in finding out where dinosaur words are and where food words are. Uh, so they'll ask, Mama, where's pancake? And we take a minute and we find where pancake is and uh, sort of walk that through with them and really try to make any opportunity that they're interested uh, in using the communication device to to use that, to make sure that, to offer that as a, a tool for them. Well, I think one of the reasons they like the dinosaur page is because, I don't know if you guys uh, remember being three, but trying to say Brachiosaurus uh, is challenging for kids who are still learning how to enunciate, right? So uh, they like to talk about all the different dinosaurs that way. This bottom picture here is a picture of Nico on the first day of school. And uh, as you can see, he's wearing his communication device on his chest. Um, which we, we send to school every day with him. He's so excited about going to school the first day that he has his thumbs up. Uh, and what we've really learned in our family is that communication is not just something that is Nico's responsibility to learn. It's something that it's uh, my responsibility to work with him on, to learn the language. It's my husband's responsibility, and you'll hear more from him later. Uh, it's uh, the twins' responsibility, we all have to learn how to communicate in this new way, just like the twins are learning English and learning our spoken, our sort of talking language, they're also learning our communication system. Our parent, both sets of our parents have uh, purchased iPads and Speak for Yourself so that they can try to get familiar with it and figure out how do they use it, and they're very intimidated and overwhelmed, and so are we. And that's one of the important lessons, I think, for, for us was to realize that even when we're feeling overwhelmed, we need to keep at it and keep going to be able to really make it happen. <clears throat> it's really part, what we have to do is figure out all the ways to use communication across all sorts of things. So when we're in the bath, when we're outside playing, how do we make it as accessible as possible so that we can do modeling and be talking about the things that are interesting to everybody um, wherever we are and people can have a chance to learn. And lots of times in the bath, this is about what it looks like uh, in terms of people's actual interests that we, we use our, our laminated paper printout uh, as a, a, a waterfall maker a lot of times, you know, uh, see how big of a splash we can make on our brothers. Um, but it's in there and people and we can use it when, when folks want to use it. So that sounds awesome, right? Oh my gosh, it's so cool. It's like easy, you can just start communicating across all different parts of your day and taking your talker with you and using it. That's cool. And then real life happens and you realize it's not only a marathon, it's like the longest, it's like a, an Iron Man actually. And it's hard and I find myself some days just feeling stuck or I notice that I won't, hmm, I'm only using the talker to talk about things that I want Nico to do or to tell him what's gonna happen next. And I feel stuck. And one of the things when I'm feeling that way is 
to try to figure out ways to get out of it. So here's a, there are a list of things. The first step, I guess, is to really think about and give myself a break. So rather than beat myself up, uh, judge myself for not being the best mom ever, um, I have to just take a breath and say, OK, this is going on, and that's fine. And the way to get unstuck is to do something. It doesn't have to be a perfect thing, but it, you do need to take a step. You can't just, you don't get unstuck by sitting still. You get unstuck by doing something, right? So here's a list of things that uh, me or somebody else in the panel or somebody else in my world has tried, actually done, to help us get out of rut. So we can watch the web of the ASF communication series webinars, ask, you know, make a plan with our partner. A lot of times uh, when Dave and I are feeling stuck, we'll sit down and say, okay, what's one thing? What's one goal that we can focus on over the next couple days to really a, a part of the day that we're going to go try to be better at communicating and doing modeling across a variety of functions? Maybe we're going to go on a special trip just one-on-one -on -one time with our kid to, do, to be able to check out and have some new experience, some new material to talk about. More things um, <clears throat> that we can do, really thinking of remembering that communication in our AAC devices is one method of communicating. But actually, I don't know about you guys, but uh, Nico certainly communicates a lot through other means, right? He uses his AAC when it is the most convenient and efficient way for him to get his point across. And he uses gestures, and he uses sounds, and he uses giving you things, and all the other ways of communicating, shaking his head, all those kinds of things, when those are the most efficient ways for him to get his point across. And that's what's most important, is that we're trying to really support him and teach him that he can uh, communicate. And whatever way he wants to communicate with us is the good, the right way for him to communicate. And we'll offer different ways. We'll offer a model if he says something using, uh, you know, uh, Nico likes to organize where people sit. And so he's like, <laughs> we say, oh, it looks like you want us to sit there. And so we'll do that, right? We, we, so that's one of the other th ways that we're trying to think about how do we support his communication. So with that, <clears throat> another one of the ways that really motivates me and helps me get unstuck is to hear the stories of other people. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa. Hello, my name is Teresa, and I'm the mother of Emma. Emma is 13 years old. She just started middle school in Nebraska, then middle school where we're at starts at seventh grade. So some of the things I'm going to talk about of how we're, we engage peers in school and how we um, bring modeling into the um, school day actually happened um, during elementary school. And then as many of you probably experienced, you transition to a new school, a whole new team, and we've sort of had to start some things over again. So know that it goes like this even within the school system as well. So one of the things that we do um, that was, is techie of the day or week, that just means that um, we have an extra iPad. Um, Emma uses Nova Chat, and so Touch Chat is, um, is that counterpart. And so one student um, has the iPad for the, um, it started out as the day, and they answer questions the teacher asks with the iPad, uh, just utilizing the iPad similar how Emma would use it in her day. We found that uh, a day wasn't really long enough. The kids, you know, it takes a while to learn. And so it was techie of the week. And um, not only was it helpful for Emma in terms of modeling, but it was also um, educational for her peers about what is that like for Emma to communicate with an AEC and why we need to give her a little bit of extra time to, to respond. There's many different ways that you, um, we incorporate that everyone has access to the language. So we provided a uh, one page core language sheet to the school and then they made copies and laminated it for every student in her class so they have them on their desk so that they can be new modeling. The teacher had um, a large one in the classroom so she, as she was talking she could then use that core language as well. There's a lot of sheets like this available on the communication training series. Um, some of those templates you can just pick at, um, print out there in PDF form so it's pretty easy to get. And then on days when there was a smart board in the classroom then it could be placed on the smart board as well. Emma had communication circles, and so um, uh, she usually wears her device on her chest, but it was sitting on the table before the pictures, so anyway, that's where uh, 
um, communication circles happened during lunch, one time a week, and it was facilitated by the speech therapist. Um, part of the communication circle was Emma inviting who she wanted to be um, in her communication circle that week. So that act alone, just being able to invite your friends to come have lunch with you, um, is a real key um, communication skill. There's lots of things that can happen during communications um, circles. Carolyn Musselwhite has awesome ideas if you um, um, just Google her in communication circles, you'll find a lot of things. Kate's presentation this afternoon is also going to provide a lot of ideas. Um, so many things um, that happen during communication circles, and it's also a really key time for um, deepening peer relationships as well. A lot of group work it was done in elementary school, and I'm finding um, quite a bit in junior high as well. And um, so this is Emma in science, one of her favorite top subjects. And so um, they would use the uh, um, core sheets and Emma her device during um, small group work. In a junior high and middle school, the way it works is it's a lot of, I'm finding it's a lot of lecture. So the teacher le lectures for 20 minutes and then they go off and do small group work or individual group work. And so then encouraging the, um, um, school system use descriptive teaching um, because that way Emma it's about her core language and not the fringe language that she's never going to talk about you know Nebraska soils um, very often in her life and so um, but she can um, show her her knowledge using that descriptive teaching method which then supports the other kids who are having difficulty learning those concepts because that method you really of teaching you really have to understand concepts so it's not benefiting em not only Emma but her peers. Um, there are many different models of core language and how to break that down to make it easy steps. And this is where we're at right now in our middle school. Because it was took a dive in terms of what we were happening, we found we needed to put it into really easy steps for the school to implement because they were feeling overwhelmed. And so we've gone back to the dynamic learning maps. And so each week there's a different focus and sometimes it goes into um, two weeks. So for one week the focus words are I like, not, and want. And then um, going on to the next week, these are um, this is what the communication series was built around, training series. And these also work really nice for sight words as well. So you get a two bang for your buck. If you are um, someone who um, child uses pod, this same concept um, is available through the interactive speech pathology. And um, there's about 14, 15 sheets where there's a focus of the week in terms of um, pod system of communicating. Just some kind of tips. I think it's really important as parents that we're able to speak to the importance of modeling. If we're not able to verbalize, this is why it's really important that everyone in their world models, then we're, we're gonna have a hard time getting the school on board. Including peer modeling within the IEP. Um, IEP goals or as a, a method I think is important. Then um, also stressing how important peer um, interaction is. The school um, just recently said, everyone loves Emma. They're just like, everyone loves her. E everyone's high-fiving her. And I'm like, you know, I don't care if everyone loves Emma. That's great that she's appreciated in the school. But I, I would rather have five close friends that she can talk with as opposed to 100 people give her a high five. Um, and so just stressing the importance of that and how it's that interaction that deepens a relationship, not a high five every morning. <laughs> Having a specific time dedicated to communication, like a communication, also being open to providing school with some provision of the materials. Here's the sheet. If you could copy and laminate it for each kid in class, that'd be awesome. And being able to bring in some small, easily um, implemented steps, like the, um, the core language and such up there that makes it less threatening for them. Because if we're overwhelmed, and we see it every day with our child, imagine a school system. So that's it. Hey everybody, and excuse me, I'm losing my voice, so <clears throat> I'm sorry about that. Um, my name's Corey, and my daughter Lily Grace is going to be eight on Monday, and there she is. Um, and she's also a pod user. You can see in the picture she's using her talker um, with Winnie the Pooh. <clears throat> and I wanted to just take a few minutes and talk with you about co-planning, which is a concept that helps us work with our kids to share their stories with the world, with their friends, with their families. Um, what I really love about co-planning as a strategy is that it doesn't take a big investment of finances or of time to be ready to do it. So anyone could go home after this weekend and you could co-plan something with your child. 
I also love that, you know, you can do this with your kids whether or not you have a robust AAC system in place. So we use POD, but there's still plenty of things that Lily Grace might want to share with her friends at school that she wouldn't be able to easily and efficiently do using her AAC system. But if we work with her behind the scenes to co-plan something, then she has it at the ready and it's much more easier for her, much more easy for her to share. So we can co-plan all sorts of things, and I'm going to quickly walk through an example of something that we co-planned. But just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we've co-planned with her, things like you know about me worksheets that come home from school. This is um, this is the page in the remnant book we're actually going to talk about co-planning. You can also co-plan things in high tech, so social scripts as well as sharing stories through your child's AAC system if they have one. So we're going to talk about co-planning a page in Lily Grace's remnant book. And there's just a few pages from her remnant book up there. And a remnant book is just a memory book or a scrapbook. And we're going to talk about um, after we went to Disneyland. And we wanted Lily Grace to have some ways to be able to go to school and share from her Disneyland experiences, because it was super fun. And she had a lot that she was really excited about. But again, we knew the pressure of going to you know, morning meeting or circle and sharing about Disneyland would be too great to expect her to do that with her AAC system. So we decided to do a page or more in her remnant book. So before we start co-planning anything, we talk about what we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, and how we're going to do it. So we set all those expectations with her before we get started. So we talked about, you know, we went to Disneyland. It was so much fun. So we're going to plan with you a page for your remnant book so you can take it into school tomorrow and you can share what you did with your friends at school. We're going to start talking about it this morning after breakfast, and then hopefully before you go to bed tonight, we'll have the page finished so you can take it to school tomorrow. And then we talked about how we did it. And what we found really helpful is to just break it down, the co-planning process, into four really clear steps. And Linda Burkhart, who was here at the Ed Summit last year, helped us develop this visual schedule, <clears throat> which has also been really helpful for us to make sure we're consistent in the steps. And then also for Lily Grace, because she really knows what's going to be expected of her in the process, and also the why. What's the outcome going to be if I work this hard um, throughout the day with my parents doing this? So the first thing that we do is we talk about it. So we talked a lot about Disneyland. And we would do that anyway, right, because Disney is awesome. Um, and we used her AC system as we were talking about it. We looked at photos. We watched videos. It was fun. It was just the family hanging out around the table in the living room, just talking about what we did like we normally would. Um, as we were talking about it, we noted what Lily Grace seemed most excited about, so the pictures and videos she wanted to go back to again and again and again. Um, and we just put those up on a whiteboard so we would have um, a point of reference to go back to when it was time to choose what she wanted to share about. So then we took a break. After all this talking and talking about coming back and choosing what she wanted to share with her friends the next day, we let her know, you take some time, go play, be with your iPad, um, whatever you want to do, and just kind of think about it. And later, we're going to come back and make a choice together. And that's what we did. So then we came back later. And we laid some choices out. We reminded her we've already talked about all the stuff we did at Disneyland. We put these things you were really excited about up on a whiteboard. And now let's look at some choices. So we put rides and shows, breakfast with Disney friends, and then different another. And there's all sorts of ways that you can do choice making with your kids. And we could pick up the conversation in the Angelman and Literacy group to share more ideas about it. We just use sticky notes, so like super high tech, right? Um, but what's most important, or one of the most important things, is that whenever we do choice making, we always put that last option of different another or something else or none of these. For our family, we tend to always do different another. Um, because maybe even though we did all that talking together and we think we know what Lily Grace was most excited about, it's always possible that we didn't get it right. And we need to give her a way to identify, you need to give me more choices. <clears throat> 
So then after Lily Grace made her choice and she chose Breakfast with Disney Friends, and actually then we did, we took another break and we did another round of choice making where we brought up the ticket for the breakfast, a photo, and then different another, so she could actually choose what she wanted to put in her remnant book. And she chose the ticket. And so step three, which is putting it in the remnant book, that's just, that's my job or Michael, her dad's job. Um, and again, it's very, very simple. It's just me and a glue stick and a pen. Um, putting the page together, I added really simple, objective, explanatory language. So just at Disneyland with the date that the breakfast happened. Um, and I try to be really careful when I'm setting up these pages not to put any subjective language in it unless it's something that Lily Grace said. So if Lily Grace, while we're talking about it, says, I think that's fun, or that was unbelievable, then I will scribe that for her on a remnant book page. So if her friends or her teachers or family members see an opinion in the remnant book, they know that's Lily Grace's opinion. But otherwise, it's just the facts. Um, and after I set up the page, then we come back together and we look at it and we talk some more and I remind her, like, you made your choices and here's the page we put together because I really want to cement the connection between all of the talking and the experiences that she's had with this page in the book. And then comes sharing, which is really the point at the end of all of this. And we try to give Lily Grace lots of opportunities to share. Um, and so she brought this page in, and it was added to the remnant book that she has at school. And so she uses that to be able to bring the book up to her friends and open to a page to share something about an experience that she's had. Uh, her remnant book has become a really important um, resource for her to pick personally meaningful writing topics at school. So she'll often choose from that when they have some self-selected writing. Um, and she also can just use it anytime she wants to go up to her friends to initiate a conversation. So it gives a starting point. So she opens up her page to, or her book to her Happy Hollow page. Oh, you went to Happy Hollow? Let's talk about that. So some things to just um, keep in mind um, is to really not worry so much if you try this about whether or not your kids seem to be following the process. It's really just going to take practice and repetition for our kids to sort of get a sense of what's going to happen next and why they do it. So the idea is just to just go with it. It's going to be messy and imperfect, but hopefully it will also be fun. Um, and then the other thing, again, is just to reiterate that processing time. So between all the steps and sometimes even within a step, it's really important to allow our kids time to process and not be so focused on the outcome of getting that page done, but enjoying the process and helping it be as meaningful as possible for them. Thanks. All right, hi everybody. I'm Kelly Meisner from Ontario, Canada, and I have a seven-year-old daughter with Angelman. Her name is Kate, and she's currently in grade two. And I am also a part-time high school physics teacher, so I've got a little bit of experience with IEPs, but by the time the kids get to me, the IEP is well-structured and well-written, and I just have to make the accommodations and modifications for the kid. From the other end, having a child with, um, who needs an IEP and needs support there has been a, quite the journey, even though I'm in the educational profession. So this has been um, kind of our learning curve. Kate is now in grade two, like I said, in her neighborhood school. And we've worked really hard with an amazing staff team to get something um, that we are really, really think is authentic, because that's what we wanted to do. We want to make sure that it's authentic for her and so that she can meet with success and that it also ties into her AAC, her, her talker. We, she is using a pod on the Compass app as well, and sometimes that's very fleeting, and sometimes it's really amazing. So I think what, like, before I get going into the curriculum stuff, I really want to emphasize the awesome stuff that's happening with all of these different families, and that we may feel like we're all put together and doing super awesome, but sometimes we've really, really struggled, and the only way we've gotten to where we are is by lifting each other up and supporting each other. And we, so many of you in this room have done that with us and helped to build this amazing foundation of where we are right now. So it's really, really cool to be a part of this, and it, it's not an easy journey, but with 
with each other, we can do this. We can do this for our kids. So um, um, what I'm trying to do is help teachers find something to model and then tie that into the curriculum because Kate's teacher this year has really led the charge on this one, which has been amazing. She's all bought into the idea of Kate's talker is her communication device and we need to make sure that, that, it, that she's got access to it and that that's well supported in the classroom. Love the ideas about how we can bring in peer supports too because the peers are really, really key to helping make sure the talker gets used. They, they help hold those adults accountable too, right? So it's really awesome. So some of the big things that we want our kids to learn it kind of tries to try to think about what's in the curriculum everywhere. Like, does it matter where you are in, in the world? And it doesn't matter what grade you're in. What's in the curricul curriculum everywhere? And there's some big ideas like comparing and contrasting in the context of same and different, more and less, big and small. And of course, lots on literacy and numeracy, right? So I tried to like figure out where we can put this and stretch that into different goals depending on where our kids are at. So here's one of Kate's math curriculum goals, and Kate's in grade two, so this is a grade two goal. Um, but we, instead of getting her to like focus on, can you identify numbers one through five, we're looking for her to identify if she knows if something is big, small, or the same. So the school did this with all on their own, made a, a measuring device, which is this has been kept the same the whole way through. And you can see that they're measuring different items in the classroom. And the, the one on the left measured two units of whatever, doesn't matter, we're just looking at the, the size. The next one is four. So what would happen here is um, the EA would model or a peer support next right beside Kate would model uh, in, in descriptions that in sizes and say, this one's big and this one's small. I'm not focused on the, does Kate know that's a number two right now? Does Kate know that's number four? I'm not focused on that, big and small, because that's what's in her device and those are the things I want her to use as she goes throughout her uh, education. And then here she's got a situation where it's the same and we know that we can easily find the word same or, or different on our devices very easily, right? So here she can identify they are the same size, two things measured the same great access into the curriculum and great access into uh, using her AAC device. Super cool. The other thing I think for math, and since I don't really, the kids that I get in physics, they know how to do math already. So I don't really spend so much time thinking about numbers until Kate came along. And then I really trying to think, well, what do I really want kids to recognize? I don't want her to do count one to five. I want her to recognize that the digit five is in the ones column and that's a small number compared to the digit 100 because that's actually the core of doing math. Recognizing the size of numbers really matters. So I'm not too, and, 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 and it's really effective because this way our kids can be exposed to the other bigger numbers that other kids in the classroom might be using. But Kate's goal here is to identify five is smaller and that 100 is bigger, and that we're looking, the fact that we're occupying the ones and tens and hundreds column there, that's what makes a number big. That's how you're gonna build the foundations of actually doing math. So to tie things into science, I'm gonna jump into what would be a grade nine science goal in Ontario. We do an astronomy unit, kids love it, so much fun, lots of really great stuff going on there. Uh, in the astronomy unit in Ontario, it we spend some time on looking at the life cycle of the star and we actually look at like solar system versus galaxy versus universe. Lots of big and small concepts happening there. So that's, this is rate a, a goal that's actually in the Ontario science curriculum for grade nine science and it's just modified for Kate with her AAC device. She will use her AAC device to identify objects in the astronomy unit as big or small. You can even make that specific as the life cycle of the star. Does it go to the white dwarf or does it go to the, to the black hole? That's both identifying either way. She can pick out what's big or small. Same concept that we used in math. Right? Like that's the whole point. We want, the, we want that language modeled in multiple steps, in multiple parts of her day. Social sciences, this is I think a grade three social sciences goal in the Ontario curriculum. They do a lot on community studies and I do, like I have, we gotta tie it in somehow. So we can look at the ancient Egyptians were a 
bigger community than the pioneers that are in our area in Elmira. So we can use that kind of language that actually identifies something that's transferable between subject areas. Kate's getting the language modeled to her a lot, right? She's getting it modeled and that's really gonna help facilitate her learning overall. She's, um, there she is, she's the one that does not have an emoji on her face and uh, she's Got a, in her classroom, we've had some really good opportunities for some peer, some peer support. And that's because we've, I've scrounged up old iPads um, and, and found them for the school and put the app on the device and the kids are learning the language with her to the point where they pick up, when Kate comes into the room, they grab a, a extra talker and say hi to her using her device. So it's really, really gorgeous. Um, but was, it's not an easy process to get there, right? Lots of work and effort to get there. Um, and then you can see that it's, it's happening naturally in the classroom, everywhere you go. And I really like the picture on the right because her, Kate's situation doesn't look much different from what's happening for the other kids in the back, right? It doesn't look much different. She's doing a, a, a modified goal, but it doesn't appear very much different. So she's integrating things really, really well. And the kids love the technology. The, the kids in the class are really happy to jump in. So that's, that's what it looks like for us. And please, um, if, but once we're all done, feel free to ask us some questions. Mary Louise is going to help facilitate that, I think. Yeah. If you, if we want to hear from you. We want to make sure that you're getting what you need out of this. Thank you so much. Before we get to questions, I saw some very glazed faces when the girls, ladies, were talking about modelling. Does everyone, hands up if you do not understand what someone means by modelling. Oh my God, you must have just been glazed over from lack of coffee. Well done. Um, so how many people here, how many of your children have what you would consider a robust AAC system? Fantastic. How many of the, keep your hands up, how many of those has been parent-led? Mm, that's most, most of the um, hands for those people watching on the live stream. Um, so it's parent power in this community. Um, we are getting more and more professionals on board. We are showing professionals that children with Angelman from day dot right up to adults with Angelman who are in their 40s, 50s and 60s, 60s are candidates for robust AAC, whether that's core language or something like pod or visual scene displays. Um, does anyone have any questions for any of these wonderful women here? Yes. Hi, Catherine. Do you want to stand up at the mic? I'll go back to... Sorry for those on the live stream giving you a headache. Is there this on? Yeah. I just had a question for Corey um, about when you were doing all the planning with Lily Grace, do you always have her pod out while you're planning and um, do you ask her sort of what she feels about certain things, or are you just kind of guessing from her expressions? Just because it got me thinking about how my daughter Alyssa is not, she's not overly expressive, so I can't really tell if she's excited about something. So for example, if I were to show her um, Minnie Mouse, I'm kind of guessing, um, is she pointing at Minnie Mouse because she thinks she's pretty, because she's scared of Minnie Mouse, or because she really likes Minnie Mouse? And I find that just takes so long for us to sort of figure out the whole reason why she's pointing at something. So I just kind of wanted to know sort of how you went worked through that. That's a great question. Is this thing on? Yes, okay. Um, so that is a really good question. And I would say that um, the co-planning process looks different all the time, even though we really do try to stick to those different steps. I would also say her pod book should be there because we always try to have it available. Her pod book um, and a talker. Um, we're still we very much believe in for her having an integrated AAC system. So we like to have the light tech and the high tech available to her all the time. Um, but I think you know I don't know. We can't always know what she's thinking. And I would say probably similarly to Alyssa for Lily Grace. You know, she goes through phases where she's more expressive um, and phases where 
we're really trying to understand and make and map meaning. And so if she points to something, you know, oh, you're pointing to Minnie Mouse. I wonder if that's because you like it. This is me pointing to a pop book. I wonder if that's, you know, because you like it. Um, or, you know, if she's doing choice making and she grabs something, um, she might be grabbing it for a sensory reason. She might be grabbing it because that is the choice that she wants to make in that moment. But we just kind of go with it and say, oh, you, ch you grabbed that. I think that's the choice that you're making. And then we kind of move on to the next step. And what that does is give her some informative feedback that if you grab that, we're going to take that as meaning that's the choice that you're making right now. But in terms of you know, her opinions on things, I mean, we can, again, do something similar. I mean, this is beyond the co-planning process. But you know, if she's pushing something away, oh, I saw you push that away. I think maybe you're telling me you're finished. Maybe you want to take a break, but I think you're telling me you're finished. And again, it's just giving her um, that feedback of when you do this with your body or you make this vocalization or that gesture, this is how I'm understanding it. And then it kind of gives a space for her to correct us. Um, I find that most often she corrects me um, and uses her pod book to correct me when I've misunderstood. Um, for example, I think she's sad, but she wants to let me know she's grumpy. So you know the nuances there, but it doesn't happen all the time. Does that help? We can talk more about it later. I have a question for you. Um, so there's so many different um, <laughs> communication tools. There's like words for life and core vocab and pod and pro loco to go. Um, and like for me, I definitely have a preference when I look at them. I like a different format over one. Um, and so I imagine it's the same with our kids. Like if they got introduced to more than one, maybe they would like one more than the other. Um, is there a point, like at what point if you've tried one and maybe they're not getting it, would you want to try a different one, or would you, or would you just stick with one and plug at it? You know, does that make sense? <laughs> um, okay, so when you're having an evaluation of a, different AAC systems, which should be in full support with your speech pathologist or your occupational therapist, um, your educator, the whole team, you have the right to try different systems and see which one uh, meshes well with you or your child or your student. Um, it may be, for many of our families, um, it's the system that the parents mesh with. If the child can, um, you know, has a pointer finger and can access pretty much everything, then if there's one that makes sense to the parents and the parents go, yeah, that's the one that makes sense to me and I'm going to use it, well, that's the best system for that family. There is no best AAC system. So if someone says to you, this is the best AAC system, what they're saying is this is the best one for us. This is the best one that got my kid talking. This is the one that finally made sense to me. That's what they mean by the best. But there is no one system that is better than anything else. What is the, the best system is the one that works in the family and the one that gets used. You can have a $35,000 Toby that sits in the cupboard that's useless. So it's about the system that works for you. Now, we have to remember that if it takes a typically developing baby 12 to 18 months of hearing spoken language before they speak and they're going to speak on their own topic, then how long is it going to take a person with Angelman before they start using it expressively? If you talk non-stop, non-stop to a baby for 12 to 18 months and it takes that long before they start to become expressive, how long, how much respect are we giving to the person with Angelman that it's going to take you that much time or longer? because you have motor planning issues, vision issues, processing issues, cognitive issues, you're having seizures half the time. So I think we need to be in it for the long haul, but really feeling in your gut that this is the, the, this decision that we have made, it is a good decision, it is a good system, and I don't care if the 15 other people on the table are using a different system. For me and my family in the place where we are now, then this is what we're using. That being said, we do have some teenagers and adults with Angelman who have been using a system, a robust AAC system, for an, um, quite a while now, and they're getting frustrated because it's not quick enough. So they are then ready for another leap. So they might be mo moving to something like um, word power, where it's got more predictive links, because they can't get their message out fast enough. 
So there is a time when sometimes you think, you know, we're doing okay with this, but maybe we can look at something else. But in the beginning, it's sometimes most often what you go with in your gut. Does thank that you. make sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, um, my name's Jennifer. Um, my daughter just turned three and we're, we just got diagnosed in March. So this is all very new to us. Um, where do we start with communication? Like I've gotten her an AAC eval mm -hmm. and they have said that she's a little too young for a device and that just to stick with pecs. And I'm insisting. Can you no. hear me crying? Can you hear my soul <laughs> dying? That's right. So I've been just repeating for people on the live stream um, that the child is three. Yes. And has been told, don't mention any speech therapist names. Um, the child has been told too young for AAC and just continue with PECS. Um, I've said no. Yeah, I'm, good and, for and, you. And I'm insisting on a 30 day. Well trial. done. Okay. <laughs> No, but so I am insisting on a 30 day trial. Yep. But what am I insisting on a trial on? Like um, they're saying these devices are $5,000, $10,000. Mm -hmm. And I don't really care what it costs. We'll yep. figure it out. But am I supposed to kind of try and push for a specific program or? So what you should be doing in this time is trialing lots of different ones. Okay. You should be getting support from your speech therapist to understand what what about that system makes sense for your child? So they should be explaining to you, what does core vocabulary actually mean? What does POD stand for if you're, st if you're starting with POD? Um, that this is a visual language system, that we are going to talk to your daughter with this system for a bloody long time before we expect her to talk back with it. Um, you need to know, okay, well, if she's three, um, is this going to be a device that she can carry around with her? You know, we saw Nico wearing his talker. If we've got an $8,000 device that's a 12-inch tablet and a three-year-old, that's just not going to work. So um, does your daughter have any access issues? You know, she might be hitting um, the iPad with her fist, so she might need um, something like a pod page set which has um, fewer buttons but just as much language. If she's got um, something like a thumb or a finger, then there's other options available to her. But because this is her system for growth, we need to know, um, you know how this is going to work for us as a family. We also need to be able to sit down and think, okay, what do I say to my child all the time? Um, do a bit of a language sample when you're in the house. Okay, you know, I say, get your shoes. I say, we're going to the shop or I'm hungry or I think you've had a seizure. Let's lie down. You look tired. How do I kind of communicate those things? What do I say a lot? And how can I say it on this device? And one of the most critical things is that if you cannot say I love you with the child's device, it is a worthless piece of device because you deserve to be able to say I love you with a child's ASE system that one day that child will expressively say back to you in ways other than headlocks and hugs and licks and kisses. Um, now, there is nothing wrong with pecs. What is wrong is that most children with Angelman are beyond pecs because they have such an intense desire to communicate. They have that communicative intent. They will drag you to things. They will shove it in your face. They will shove your face in it to say, this is what I'm talking about. So we are beyond pecs. We are looking at language now. So I would be pushing back on the speech therapist saying, OK, what exactly am I supposed to be doing with this? We need to also appreciate that a lot of speech therapists are not AAC um, experts. Some have only had one or two classes in their um, career at university. Um, if your speech therapist does not feel confident in this area, I would say, can I have a talk to an assistive technology person? They're an assistive technology lending library in my state. Um, I'm more than happy to continue this kind of discussion. We have a Facebook group called Angelman Communication Literacy and Education, I think. We'll put a link in the fast weekend thing. Um, but this is where a lot of our discussions take place. And just know that you are not alone. Four years ago, your story was probably 90% of the population. Now we've probably got it down to about 79% of the three-year-olds. So it was slowly, slowly chipping away. But again, it's the parents that are going, no, I need this and I need this now. So I'm happy to continue talking okay. about this after, but you're on the right track, track and I'm really thrilled that you said no. Okay, thank so. you. Woohoo to you. Um, 
All right. Um, I'll just stand up here. Now, there was a bit of confusion earlier. Someone said, am I allowed to stay in the dad's talk even though I'm a mum? Yes, you are. <laughs> and you're also allowed to stay in the adults and teens talk even if your child is a little person um, because it's more about um, modelling and we're going to be discussing, read, talking about things like remnant books, but um, you're not banished if your child is under teenage years at 11 o'clock. Right, so thank you very much for having us today. Um, it was absolutely wonderful and thank you to these wonderful five women here. Thank you, ladies. And while you guys are moving around, I wanted to remind everyone that the internet code for access down here is FAST 2016. Inspire me. Always. It's so important Oh, it is. Yep. I know, I know, yeah.